Father, is confession required in order to receive Holy Communion? I have a deep desire to confess, but I recently moved to Serbia and the priests don't speak English. I don't know how I would communicate my confession to them. What can I do? Yeah, that's challenging. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, priests, they may have, um, like in the monasteries where you have uh, um, a priest monk, let's say, who doesn't speak English, another one of the monks uh, will come and translate. I mean, this is, that person would have to be chosen, obviously, by the priest who's making the confession. When you're in a foreign country, it, that could be something that may be available if there's someone there. The best way, of course, is always to confess in the presence of the Father Confessor. Today, sometimes that's difficult because Father Priests are transferred, uh, people move, and they're not within the same geographic region of where they're, where they're uh, able to do that. Uh, I know some people will confess over the phone, which I think is not ideal for sure. Uh, but it could be an option for you know a person like this if they remain a, uh, remain connected with their father confessor from the country that they're living in that they can manage in, in some way to do that we, ha we we're in a place you know we have these sort of ideals and these uh, for a lack of better term I'll use the word rules although orthodoxy really doesn't have rules that the best is to be with a person. But today, with the, as transient as, as people are in the world, if we want to maintain a connection with someone, then we have to find some alternative ways to do, th do them, you know. Somebody asks, if I'm not able to convert yet due to family issues, should I be diligent in my Protestant church still and in my volunteering slash leading worship, or should I stop my roles there? Yeah, these, these sort of questions are... are a little difficult just to throw out an answer and say, do this. For me, I, I always want to sit down with somebody and find out more information because there's more to it than just that. Uh, there's not always a quick answer. I mean, if a person's heart is in the Orthodox Church and they love being present in the worship and their readings and participating to the extent that they can, in all the, all the ways that they can, then it would be better for them, I think, to, to be in the Orthodox Church, to worship there and to learn and to grow and to have company with and to speak with the, with the priest and uh, in, in their own uh, journey and all of that. I, I, to me, it, it would seem like that would be better than to remain in the Protestant world and, and continue to, to worship there and to lead worship and do those sort of things. It's interesting to me because I think that that would be something in their own heart that they would have a little bit of a struggle with. Here's another question. Convert problem question. That's what they say. How do I stop over-intellectualizing the faith and really move it to my heart where it should be to truly love God? We can never experience God through our intellect. We can only experience God through the heart. The intellect is a faculty that God has given us to use, but it's not the means by which we descend into the heart to be in communion with Him. I think that the easiest, the easiest answer would be to, to ask God to help, to help you so that you don't intellectualize the faith and that you begin to make that journey into the heart. It goes back to what I said earlier. Pray, but begin your prayer with gratitude and thanksgiving then allow it to move into repentance, and then speak the words, Lord, help me to live my life in you through my heart. I don't want to approach you through my intellect and through logic and reasoning and all of these sort of things. It's, it's really a waste of time. We have saints in the church who couldn't even read, so they weren't approaching their, the faith or the understanding of the faith through books and through lectures and through, well, we didn't, they didn't even have internet and things like that, but they simply, uh, went, they simply approached Christ with humility and God revealed to them divine truths that they had and they would speak words of, of wisdom, you know, great things. Somebody asks, how does secular music affect the soul? Well, that's a great question. I mean, secular music is a very broad spectrum of music. You know, I have found that 
if I allow my mind to be in something other than Christ and, and prayer, then my mind is distracted. And this is just, I think, more recently for me personally, music to me has become that, uh, a distraction and an attachment. It could be even something we've become reliant upon or dependent upon to help us through. I think a lot of this happens because we don't have a, a deeper relationship with our Lord. And so we, we use things in the world to distract us and we use things in the world to find a connection with, to maybe find purpose or meaning or happiness or joy, when all of the things that the world can give in terms of those are just fleeting. They don't have substance to them. They're very temporary. But what our Lord can give us in terms of that are much deeper and much more satisfying to us. If I spend an hour listening to secular music, what does that do for me ultimately? What do I come away with from that? Where has my mind been during that time? Where has my heart been during that time? Where it, what sort of uh, sensations have been conjured up in my body and my being during that time? If I spend that same amount of time in prayer or in reading scripture or reading something spiritual, how would I answer all those questions? So where do you want to be ultimately? If one wants to become Orthodox, is it a requirement that their spouse also be Orthodox? It's not a requirement. It would be much better. There are many mixed marriages within the Orthodox Church. This is through what they call economia or having flexibility. The word for spouse in Greek is sizigos, which, uh, which means to be yoked to another. So if you think about that visually, two oxen um, and the wooden yoke that goes around and underneath and it's clamped together, that we're yoked to our spouse, they're our yoke mate. And to have one with a goal and a purpose and a desire to pursue the kingdom of heaven and to live that life, if the other is not a part of that, it's, it's more difficult than if the other shares that goal and purpose and together they're, they're moving in that direction. Um, so it's, it's uh, permitted, but it's also difficult. And then, you know, when children come into the world, um, they're expected to be, you know, baptized in the faith and brought up in the faith. It also becomes difficult when one, if the mother or the father who's not orthodox isn't participating or not supporting and contributing to that, you know, to that life in Christ. Uh, that's also challenging. But the Orthodox Church permits uh, mixed marriages. There are exceptions. They have to be, a, 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 this person has to be uh, a part of a recognized body of Christianity. And there are certain ones that are and certain ones that aren't. Why did God allow so many people to find him in many heretical groups instead of leading them to orthodoxy? Well, again, I mean, God desires all to be saved, number one, and the Holy Spirit works outside of the church to bring those into the church. Many people come to other Christian faiths uh, before they arrive at the orthodox faith. Some may never uh, come to know and be a part of the of the the. Uh, the body of Christ, the Orthodox Church, which takes us back to the question about salvation, you know. It's very similar to, you know, why did God use an African-American Protestant minister to begin to water the seed that had been planted in me at my baptism to bring me to where I am today. This is by the mercy and the love of God, you know, to bring all people to himself. All right, next question is, what are your thoughts on the state of ecumenism in the church? Yeah, I don't, I'm not really up on what the state of ecumenism is today. I was more aware of it 
40 years ago, 35, 40 years ago when I was going through seminary. But since then, I really don't know what the state of ecumenism is today. I don't know where things are. I don't know at what level there's dialogue and uh, all of those sort of things. Is that something to be desired at some point, to, to, to seek some type of unity? Well, it's good to desire that that unity happen. That's not the issue. The issue is how does that happen and what does that look like? The Orthodox Church professing uh, itself as the one holy Catholic, i.e. universal apostolic faith, having the fullness of all the teachings of Christ and the, the practices <clears throat> and so forth, um, desires it all come in, into this. So what does unity look like? Unity is not compromise, nor is it, is it accepting uh, something that is other than what is a part of the fullness. So ultimately, unity is that all would come in return to the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith that was started by Christ and has been the same faith since the time of our Lord and Pentecost and through the centuries without change, without alteration, all of those sort of things, you know. I, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't see a problem with having dialogue. We have to just be very clear in terms of what our true desire, hope, and intentions are for those, for that dialogue, you know. The next question is, how do you view Eastern Catholics who are fully Orthodox in theology, but in communion with Rome? How do I view them? Well, they're not in communion with the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're, they have the same practice liturgically as the Eastern Orthodox Church, as, as um, Eastern Catholics, Byzantine, right, Catholics. The liturgy, their services are very similar with some exceptions, like they say the Filioque and the Creed, uh, the, and they, they commemorate the Pope, um, and maybe some other things, but they're not part of the, uh, the Orthodox faith, you know. So this person says, I come from a Muslim background. How do the Father and the Son differ? I often struggle knowing how to pray because I have always prayed to, quote unquote, God. If he is God, can I just pray to God and it be the same? I'm assuming they're Christian now. Yeah. The God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are of the same essence, one essence. But they are distinct in their personhood. Christ said, I and the Father are one. He who has seen me has seen the Father. They're of the same essence. This is why we make uh, our hands, uh, put our hands in this configuration when we make the sign of the cross. It's, a, it's an expression of our theology. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, but of one essence. And these two fingers represent that Christ was fully God and fully man. Um, the distinction is that God is the originator of the Godhead. Christ is the Son of God, begotten of the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Those are the distinctions. Other than that, I mean, it's, it's one God. It's not three gods, it's one God. Uh, one God and three, and three persons. <clears throat> and we see that in the Old Testament too, where there's reference to the Spirit of God and the Word of God and, and so forth in the creation story. What are some of the most common reasons why converts leave the Orthodox Church? You know, that's a really good question, and I don't know if I have a whole lot of answers. Um, I'll mention a couple that I, that I think uh, may be um, reasons um, from my own experience with working with them. Sometimes people come into Orthodoxy like a hot rocket, <laughs> there's a, all this zeal and all this enthusiasm and they're just devouring consuming all of this all of these teachings and and all of these things and if, if they're not tempered in a way and 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 helped to slow down their zeal and they're brought in too quickly 
they will flame out as quickly as they flamed in. It really requires a, a priest to do his due diligence in uh, pacing and tempering, I think, people who come in with a lot of zeal. The other thing that, I, that I've noticed, again, this isn't a lot. I, I haven't seen a lot of converts leave the, the church. Um, a, a couple other things. One is that if a person is a part of a church or is under the guidance of a priest and um, that particular clergy is very austere and really strict and really um, speaking more about what you should do and not do and what's right and what's not right, which a lot of people look for. But if it becomes a very rule-oriented experience, then that, that, that can be dangerous for people. And then the third thing is that some people, and I don't see it as much as being an issue within the church as it is with an, the individual <clears throat> where they're very easily scandalized and maybe even sometimes looking for things to be scandalized by. They're scanning constantly to see, you know, what, where, where the danger signs are or whatever. But if people are easily scandalized um, by what a priest said or did or what a bishop said or did or whatever, and then they leave that parish and then they go to another parish and then they're easily scandalized there by something that someone said or did, a priest or whatever, or whatever. These sort of things, I, I, people, I've seen people eventually uh, leave which is really sad because for me, um, it's tapping into something that uh, really ha there's a source of pain uh, experience in, in someone's own life that it's tapping into in a sense um, where they, they feel lied to or um, they can't trust, uh, but it taps into some traumatic uh, lived experience and it causes them to uh, experience basically a fight or flight traumatic response and so they leave you know uh, but they're never really satisfied no matter where they go so it's not it's not really an issue because the the church is a hospital we're all sinful even priests are going to make mistakes and things that they see and or things that they say or something they do or by a lack of response to some you know anything like that um, but if we're cultivating our heart in the right place then we're being patient we're we can talk to someone or talk to the priest or whatever and have dialogue. But that would be the other thing I think is that some people are just very easily scandalized by things.